permission to come aboard. Before we get started, does anyone want to get out? And here we go. Live from the Hollywood foothills of North Carolina, welcome to the 112th edition of the Confirmed Epic Podcast, the official podcast of theepicreview.com, and I, of course, am your host, The Real Brad Bell. Thank you for clicking play today on YouTube, whether you're listening in your car, on your computer, on your phone, we greatly appreciate it. You guys have been listening, you've been responding to the new format of various topics mixed in with some different types of reviews compared to what we've done in the past and as a result we have finally it took us a long time but we've just kind of shifted our focus to YouTube so in essence it didn't take as long as it may look we have reached over 100 subscribers at the time of this recording we're at about 104 105 subs Thank you so much to everyone, whether you're a friend who sub, whether you're somebody who found the show online. Some of you guys have been with us since day one back in 2013, and I greatly appreciate it. I know Jerry would say the same thing. And let's just talk about YouTube real quick at the top of the show, just some housekeeping here. We have now, since we reached over 100 subs, a custom URL. It's no longer a bunch of random numbers and letters. It is youtube.com slash confirmed epic podcast. You type that into your browser. You type that into your Safari browser on your phone. Uh, you type it into Google. You're going to find us. And that is awesome. And we couldn't have done that without you guys. If you're listening to this and you're enjoying it and you have not subscribed, please hit the subscribe button. Please hit the like button. Leave comments below. It, it is kind of uh, weird when you see audio podcasts on YouTube, but for someone who is not doing it professionally, just doing it passionately about the things that they love, it is a convenient way to archive your thoughts. So again, thanks for that. I don't want to announce anything yet, but I think we're sitting here in March now. If we could in some way get to 150 to maybe 200 subs by the end of the year i think i'm going to do some type of giveaway some type of random giveaway 150 may be something small but if we would get to 200 subs by the end of 2021 or the beginning of 2022 i think i could have a very very big uh, giveaway plan some type of valuable comic if it were graded uh, some type of valuable omnibus to give away to listeners. So if you haven't sub, make sure you do. Uh, without further ado, nobody here came here to talk about uh, YouTube logistics, YouTube sub stuff. You come to this channel because you love to hear the geeky topics that we discuss, that we break down. And today, the main topic I wanted to focus on, and I'm just going to get into it right from the start of the show, is comic collecting. But not some deep dive into the history of comic collecting, you know, from the gold and silver, bronze, to now the even newly named copper, and then the modern age. I want to talk about collecting comics in the comic book marketplace in 2021. The reason I wanted to do this is because in multiple ways, the comic book marketplace is blowing up. I'm not talking about the movies. I'm not talking about the MCU, DCEU, uh, the various movies based on different superhero and non-superhero comic book properties. Uh, those have been growing and growing and growing, it seems, since Iron Man and, and The Dark Knight in 08. Uh, and really hitting their stride in 2012 with the Avengers and maybe the peak with Endgame, although WandaVision shows that maybe we have not quite reached the peak as far as superhero movies, television, that type of thing. No, 
Uh, I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about here is the source material and a newly ignited passion behind that source material. Something that's gotten me very excited. I write a lot on my Tumblr about the comics I read and mainly graphic novels and, and other various collected editions and I was writing a review on there. I won't get into which one because that would take us uh, on a different tangent. It was a rather good book but I said a lot of times comic fans are overly protective of these properties and these characters because when a comic book is written well, it is the character. And I've said variations of stuff like this on the Confirmed Epic podcast before. But like I tried to say then, when a writer, let's say for example Scott Snyder, has a honed-in authentic voice to a character like his Batman in New 52, it is Batman when you're reading it. It's not just Scott Snyder's Batman. Yeah, you feel that. You you feel the creator's take, but you get swept away in the material. Same thing for like Ed Brubaker's uh, run on Captain America that introduces the Winter Soldier uh, and, and all that stuff. Uh, Gail Simone on Batgirl with the New 52 and uh, Matt Fraction on Iron Man. When you read these books, you don't hear necessarily, oh, oh yeah, I'm envisioning Robert Downey Jr. playing Iron Man to use that Fraction Iron Man example. No, it is Iron Man. So, when these things are not portrayed on screen to match up with the authenticity, the beloved authenticity that comic book readers have come to know, to be honest, we can get sour sometimes. And I, that goes back to last week with the WandaVision review. There's just some things, especially around the character, uh, that I didn't like. And I apologize to anyone if I came across negative in that review. I try not to be negative. God knows uh, in the past couple of years we've had enough negativity in this world. And this is all stuff that makes me happy that I talk about. But at the same time, I'm going to give you uh, my true thoughts on here. I'm not going to be a, a false positive, if you will. But let's talk about this boom in the comic book industry. And I think what fascinates me about this is value is increasing across multiple different platforms of reading. The single issues are hot. And I'm going to talk about that uh, in here in a minute. What types of single issues are hot? Maybe we can speculate why that might be. Uh, but before I do that, I'm kind of going to touch on the way that I collect comics primarily now. I'm not opposed to picking up a single issue here or there. But I have got into collected editions. Now, once I had Harper, my first daughter, I named after Harper Rowe, speaking of Scott Snyder's Batman, a.k.a. Bluebird, how much I love this stuff, guys. Once I had Harper, it just got to be a little much to, this was before you know COVID, to go out and do my monthly books, my pull list, go to the shop, uh, just a, a little of the story here, a little bit of the story there with lack of sleep. Uh, that's not a good combination for enjoying, absorbing, retaining the material that we all love. So I said, I'm going to switch to more graphic novels, trade paperbacks, which I had done mixed with single issues, but I made that my primary way of reading. Now, those are always going to be popular. They're easy to read as far as the marketplace, unless they go out of print for a significant amount of time, they're not going to be. And the big books never go out of print. So Watchmen, for example, has never went out of print because if it does, at least it's never been out of print for an extended period of time. It may have been for a couple months here and there. But if it does, the rights revert back to Alan Moore. That was part of the contract. Well, guess what? DC's never going to stop printing Watchmen because they don't want to lose the rights to those characters that are uh, second behind probably the Justice League as their their most popular team as far as what's owned by DC Comics. You've seen them bring them into the main continuity uh, with Doomsday Clock. But the big stories, the Dark Knight Returns, are 
are very rarely going to go out of print. And believe it or not, with trade paperbacks, DC does a better job, I think, of keeping those in print. We've seen stuff like Insanity, House of M went out of print, and because of WandaVision being so popular, I saw that book selling for like 230 bucks on uh, eBay. And to quote the great Rob Liefeld, whoa, from his podcast. I mean, it was like, what? This is a $17 graphic novel. This is a, a comic that could have been had for $25.30. This trade paperback on eBay before this show, but these shows are driving the marketplace too, even when it comes to something as simple as a trade paperback uh, a graphic novel. When I say that, it, it is going to be a non-hardcover collected edition trade paperback graphic novel. Uh, sometimes interchangeable, but a trade paperback always going to obviously based on the name called paperback and the be paperback. And the reason for this being a trade paperback is back in the day. Like when I was a kid, you would get one, you would read it, you would trade it to a friend, you would swap it with a friend. Uh, Hey, I read Watchmen, but I haven't read Dark Knight Returns. Less swap, maybe you swap for good, maybe you swap back or you trade back after you have read those said trade paperbacks. Now, what has really blown up as far as the collected editions are the omnibuses, which are the these tomes, almost textbook-like, complete run of a story or a complete run of a writer and artist run on a story. And this is the bug that has bitten me. I've rearranged my wife and I, Abby, the mother of Beagles, rearranged our entire bedroom to accommodate her Harry Potter collection. That's her thing. And uh, my omnibus collection. I'm going to turn here. I'm going to turn the mic. So if, if the audio goes out, I'm just going to look at I probably have about 20 of them. And I, I bought about three back in 2013. I bought like the Jim Lee X-Men, Claremont X-Men, and the McFarlane Spider-Man Omnis. And uh, hey, those were cool to have, but I didn't start collecting them then. Then, as this collected edition boom happened in the past year, year and a half, uh, I really uh, got into it. So, it can be something like... Scott Snyder, Greg Capullo's Batman Volume 1, and it has the first 38 or so issues of that great run in the New 52. It gives you an opportunity to go back and own and read comics that you could never uh, pick up off the stand, obviously, because they're long out of print, they're long been disposed. Like, for example, I have the first three volumes of the Golden Age Batman. Is that stuff cheesy? Yes, but it's been restored with color. The mapping has been redone. The mapping is the order of the books as far as making the most sense chronologically, uh, either based on the chronology of the story itself or the chronology of the actual release date of that material. Now, it's a great way to have a complete story such as Secret Invasion, different artists, different writers, but you get all the tie-ins uh, right there. And there's been some books that, ha- sorry, some stories, excuse me, that have been collected in omnibuses and some that hadn't, but with the this recent kind of takeoff of the collected edition in the marketplace, I think within the next five, ten years, within this the end of this decade, at one point you're going to have a chance to own every major story uh, that the big two has put out in omnibus format. Hey, Warners and DC has had some shakeups, some layoffs. So I think that they're a little bit behind. But goodness, Marvel is pumping these things out uh, left and right. So some recent ones I picked up, like Grant Morrison's Justice League. Now, kind of weird how they did this because it only had the Grant Morrison issues. So there was a story there where... Mark Wade, the great Mark Wade, did a f- some fill-in issues when Morrison took a break from the book, and that ended up being Tower of Babel, which became a very famous Justice League story within that run. So you get three-quarters of the way through that book, there's some issues missing in the numbering, 
and that was Mark Wade's Tower of Babel. They're releasing that in another collected edition, a, very, a smaller one compared to the Morrison Justice League Omnibus. And then it picks, all, picks up when Morrison comes back. That, something like that's frustrating. So I think it depends on the Omni. You're either going to get a creator's run on that story or you're going to get more of that complete story. It seems like DC is more focusing on a creator's run. So if there's fill-in um, writers or there's a a break in the book, or that's where you're not going to get those issues. So, for example, Hellblazer by Garth Ennis. I picked up that omnibus. He went away from the book for a little bit, came back, so it's missing some issues in the middle, but you're still getting Enos's full take on the character. That's a little frustrating, but sometimes to make these omnibuses fit, they have to uh, do that. That's what DC's chosen to do, whereas Marvel is more like, hey, let's get the complete story. So they had the Age of Apocalypse, the great X-Men story from the 90s. They had that whole story mapped out, different writers, different artists, and then they did a companion to even add to the material that they could not fit in that main omnibus. An omnibus is an oversized edition, so it's going to be bigger than a trade paperback, bigger than a standard hardcover, and it's going to match the size of what's called a deluxe edition, and those are going to match up nicely uh, on the shelf. Now, I'm not trying to necessarily break down uh, everything that we have here as far as the different formats. It's more about the marketplace. But that being said, I know there's a lot of people that are coming to this podcast who have read a comic here or there, pick one up at, at Goodwill or found one in their, their grandfather's garage or attic or something, and they don't know what any of this is. So I do think it it is worth kind of going into what these are. So that's the omnibuses. DC does something, and for a while they didn't do omnibus. They only did these called the Absolute Edition. The Absolute Edition is going to be a huge book, bigger than an omnibus, not as far as the thickness. It's usually thinner. It's usually going to be not as many issues, but it is oversized it is restored meaning the color is restored uh, to most of the time sometimes they don't restore the color but if it's an older story they restore the color they blow it up they put it in this big slip case it has this nice tassel tab that is in there and these are massive on the shelf I love them I got the two absolute swamp things for Christmas. My in-laws got them for me. The third volume's coming out, I think, in October. So I hope to get that next Christmas. This is Alan Moore's swamp thing I'm referencing. I mean, just the details they went into in that book. The cover, they made it like mossy, like it was part of the swamp. And they restored every bit of color in that book. Uh, That was controversial to some OG Swamp Thing readers because they're like they didn't want it messed with. Kind of like you got the special editions in the original Star Wars trilogy. They didn't mess with the story though. In this case at all, it was just the look of the book was much fresher. It popped. Colors have evolved. Colors have changed in comic books since the 1980s, 85, 86 when this book uh, was coming out uh, in the late 80s. Actually, it may have been like 87, 88, because I think it was after Alan Moore had done Watchmen. So you got these giant absolutes. I only have three of those. They do take up a lot of room. Some people just collect these. I have Kingdom Come and those two Swamp Things. <clears throat> now, there are these uh, artist editions that don't have word bubbles sometimes. Sometimes they do. And it's weird because sometimes Marvel and DC will put them out. Sometimes people like IDW will put them out. These are like as big as the original sketches of the art. They're black and white. They're not colored. For example, the Jim Lee artist edition of X-Men just came out. But Marvel didn't put it out. IDW partnered with Marvel to put it out. It's like a $200 book. And it is just closest you're going to get to owning those original pages uh, or any of those original pages of Jim Lee's X-Men unless you're very wealthy 
we should talk about pricing here. An omnibus at retail is going to cost a smaller one. Maybe you get 75, but most of them are 100 to 125, and absolutes are 75 to 100. Deluxe hardcovers are thinner. They are the size of an absolute. Those are usually 20 or 30. That's usually one small story within a run. And then you have these image puts these out, these soft cover compendiums. These are a cheap and convenient way to get a hold of a lot of a comics run and pour through the material. They're not the most convenient way because whereas an omnibus maybe has 40 issues and with an omnibus it's hardcover and most of the time Marvel and DC now they have sewn the binding so they've sewn cloth onto the binding and then they have when I say sewn binding they have taken the pages and they have sewn the pages to that binding and then with that binding they have sewn it to the book. They had pressed it against the book. Sometimes you have glued binding, which is not as good. You get what's called gutter loss, meaning in between you may get some words cut off. You may get some images cut off. Uh, the pages may not naturally lay down. But as omnibuses get more and more popular, this seems to occur less and less. So you can tell this is a subject I'm very passionate about. I have not been... A, excited about collecting anything uh, other than maybe when I first got into Mondo posters the way that I'm excited about these omnibuses and collected editions uh, right now and the thing about omnis is when they're in print they can be had for usually below retail so for example the Amazing Spider-Man volume 2 I'm talking about the original stuff here this is, I think this is when it's going from Stan to Jerry Conway and Ditko's left the book and John Romita Sr.'s on the book, which draws, I think he draws the most iconic Spider-Man, the one that you see on lunch boxes and shirts and stuff even to this very day. If you see Spider-Man, if it's not from a cartoon, if it's not from a movie, this is Spider-Man, it's probably John Romita Sr. Spider-Man. But what you have... This book just got its second printing, and get it on eBay for seventy six bucks. You can get it on Amazon for seventy eighty bucks, depending on the day. Uh, even though it's a hundred hundred twenty five dollar book, great, right? As soon as that thing goes out of print, that one hundred seventy five dollar book is going to be a two three hundred dollar book, and as a result. Omnis, omnibuses have some of the highest rate of FOMO when it comes to comic collecting, fear of missing out. We all know what FOMO is by this point in 2021. And people, a lot of times, start buying omnibuses at a rate that they can never read. And they start buying omnibuses that they will never read even if they had infinite time, even if they could slow time down with a time stone. They just wouldn't read them. They just want to have them to have them because they're afraid the book will go out of print, it will get very expensive, and they won't be able to afford it. Or in some cases, you may, like the Alan Moore Captain Britain omnibus, you may never be able to find it. It's just They're all gone. By the way, Marvel just announced they're doing a reprint of that, so... Look for those out-of-print prices on eBay uh, to, to become reasonable. I think they're reprinting that book. This has been a, a, what's called a well, meaning a white well in Moby Dick. If you've ever read that book, Ahab's White Well. A well is a book that has been out of print for a long time. The omnibus collectors are thirsting after, ha look for Maybe they stumble upon one in a LCS, a local comic book store, and the LCS owner doesn't realize what he has, and you get it for the 100 125 retail. But the fear is that these books will be in print for a year. They'll sell out. They'll reach this well status, and you will miss out. So a lot of times people get in over their heads. They buy, buy, buy. It's a year in. 
to collect an Omnis. They've got 50 Omnis. They've read half of one Omni. And it's like, oh crap, I need to sell one of these. I'm not the biggest Captain Britain fan. Maybe I don't need this. I'm not the biggest Flash fan. I, I just bought this to have it, you know. So, just like anything, collect what you like. Collect for story and character first, uh, not just uh, value. Unless you're just legit trying to flip stuff and make a profit to buy stuff uh, that you, you really want to buy. And a big part of this blow up of these omnibuses, these absolutes, these collected editions has been these omni YouTube channels. And there's two that I want to point you to. One is Jim Mint Collectibles. Now, he does statues. He does single issues. Uh, for a long time, he was primarily focused on statues, then primarily focused on omnis. Now, it's a mix between the both. He's how I found out about omnibuses and the ones that were out of print and what a well was. He kind of uh, brought me in. My friend Will, who also collects these, told me about Jim Mint. And uh, he's a he's a good guy. I like him and his wife Fee. He's he's a little older. He's got grown kids. He's got a little more disposable income uh, than most people do. Even before his YouTube channel blew up, and he had over a hundred thousand subs. Go check out Jim Mint. He doesn't need me to suggest his channel, but there's a lot of good information there. But to me, as good as Jim is, the absolute best. YouTuber and source of information is Omar, the Uncanny Omar, and his YouTube channel is Near Mint Collection. Just type that into YouTube, go through his videos. He has connections at Marvel, so he gives you information on new books that are coming out before anybody else. He doesn't have those connections at DC, so not as much DC stuff on there, although he does have DC stuff on there. He does do advanced reviews and stuff. First of all, He's a super nice guy. He's a little younger. He's got younger kids. And, uh, man, he just loves this stuff. And he is passionate about the stories and the characters, which really drives what he buys. He, now, he has a crap ton of stuff, but he gets a lot of it to review. It's not like he's buying all of this stuff. But, for example, he talked about the New Warriors omnibus for years and years and years. It finally got reprinted, and it was just, or printed for the first time, not reprinted, and it was just cool to see his passion shine through on that. I just, I, I loved it, and he, about a year or two ago, really started doing these top 10 most wanted omnibuses, or top 10 reprints, and he focused on Marvel, because I think he's more of a Marvel than a DC fan, that's apparent, that's fine, and Marvel started paying attention, and guess what they started doing? They started reprinting the books from his top 10 list, which is crazy that a corporation like Disney and a, whoever's over the collected editions at Marvel within that corporation of Disney listens to this YouTuber who has only, I say only, I mean, you're talking to somebody who was happy to hit 104 subscribers. He has like 40,000 subs they just hit, but he will point you into some uh, great reading material, great places to get books. I don't recommend eBay. If you're going to buy these books, look at the solicitation, see when stuff's going to come out. The two that I recommend, one is CheapGraphicNovels.com. That's where I order all my books. You can't pre-order, but the day the books come out, you sometimes the day before, so comics come out on Wednesday, so sometimes on Tuesday afternoon, they put the books up for order. They got great shipping. You can pay 15 for quick shipping. You can pay 7 for standard shipping. And it, it's pretty much flat rate shipping no matter how big the order is. You can get 50 pounds of books or 5 pounds of books. It's going to be 8 or it's going to be $15. A new one is organic price books. I'm not too familiar with them. My friend Will, who I mentioned earlier, who collects these, uh, says that they are about just as good as CheapGraphicNovels.com. There are other sources out there, of course, Amazon, but a lot of times book arrive damage, eBay, sometimes you get ripped off. And, I'm hey, I just bought a couple Omnis on eBay. I'm not knocking eBay. I sell stuff. I buy stuff on eBay all the time. That being said, you know the risks you take with eBay. There are other sources out there, I'm not going to name names, who used to be the A-game as far as selling discounted elect, um discounted 
collected additions, and they've went downhill. Uh, so just want, don't want to be. I want to be positive. Don't want to bash anybody. I want to recommend cheapgraphicnovels.com and organic price books. So that is kind of the Omni game, the collected edition game, uh, just blowing up. But that is we've been seeing that on the rise kind of steadily over the past year year and a half so I don't want to say it's a boom in the industry I think it's a trajectory a positive trajectory in the industry that's giving fans what they want it is giving collectability to something other than single issues you buy an omnibus it's going to hold its value and it's going to go up in value when it goes out of print now when they print it again it will go down in value but then inevitably it will go out of print again and it will go up in value but it's going to hold usually what you put into it especially if you pay below retail initially and it's been fun getting into this but when it comes to comics as far as collectability historically this changed in the 90s a little bit when the bottom fell out of the market because people bought up a ton of foil cover number ones for X-Men and stuff and thought it was going to put their kids through college. They bought the books just to sell them. They printed so many of the books. The books were not even worth the dollar twenty-five people paid for them. And a lot of those books got tossed. So with the exception of the 90s, the bread and butter of collecting comics has always been the single issue. And boy, are those on the rise again. I've never seen a boom in comics like this since I've been reading and buying. I don't buy single issues. I regrettably sold seven loan boxes for 300 bucks to my LCS, which was not bad, especially for modern comics. But I sold them right before the market took off. As other markets went down during COVID, some went up, and <laughs> comic books apparently were one of the ones that went up during COVID and just continue, again, that upward trajectory. We're moving on from those collected editions, talking about single issues now. When I sold those comics... I knew I had some books that were more valuable in there, and if I would have taken the time to go through and sell them all on eBay, I'd have got more than 300 bucks. but the convenience outweighed the profit for me at that point. I was literally trying to clear out room in my son's closet for all his baby stuff because we had just had our second kid, and hey, extra 300 bucks to put toward formula, put toward an omnibus, whatever. I was happy. Uh, with what I got out of it. I'm not complaining. I actually sold them to Jim at Jim Wass Collector's World, who I used to buy from growing up. Used to be a sponsor of this show. Check them out. If you're in the North Carolina area, as far as around Charlotte, surrounding area. But anyway, as much as I love Jim, I kind of regret selling him those books because all of a sudden, we are starting to see single issues be hotter than they've ever been again since I've been buying. I've been buying since House of M and 06 in different forms of comics, but I've been consistently buying comics, whether single issues, trades, you just heard me talk about omnibuses. And fear of missing out is driving this too, because first appearances are blowing up. And you had seen this, so for example, Ironheart Riri Williams, who's going to get a Disney Plus show, um, hey, her first printing was going for 100 150 bucks. her second printing was going for 80 bucks. as far as her debut, I think it was Invincible Iron Man number 7, which was a cameo uh, appearance, and then Invincible Iron Man number 8, which was her first uh, full appearance. Uh, in Miles Morales, that was a big one as far as Ultimate Fallout. He appeared, I think it was Ultimate Fallout 4. It was a mini series following the Ultimatum event. And Miles, that first printing, hey, that book was going for 500 bucks. Second printing, you know, two, 300 bucks. But Miles was a popular character. I attributed that more to the popularity of the character more than I did a change in the comic books industry 
Kind of the same way with Spider Gwen. She blew up after debuting an Edge of Spider Verse number two, getting her own uh, comic book series uh, from Robbie Rodriguez, Jason Latour, uh, Rico Renzi. I went to a signing of theirs that they did when Spider Gwen number one came out. And for my birthday, I think it was when I turned 28. My wife bought me Edge of Spider Verse number one, first print. I was able to get them to sign it. It was the greatest birthday I probably have had as an adult. Uh, it was so much fun interacting with uh, comic book fans as we waited in line at Sheldon's Heroes. Sheldon's the owner of Heroes Aren't Hot, Hard to Find. Uh, who put on Heroes Con in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, the biggest comic books convention in the Southeast, focusing on comics, not just movies and TV. And we waited in line for four or five hours, got them to sign it. I was just going to get my copy of Spider-Gwen number one signed, and I ended up getting that signed, but my wife's like, it's your birthday, let's get you something big. She bought me Edge of Spider-Verse number two, that book at the time blew up to about a hundred dollar book. That's what I paid for it. It was a sentimental gift. Gwen Stacy's my favorite female in all of Marvel comics, so the fact that they were bringing her back as a heroine really uh, got me excited. I read most of that first full volume of Spider Gwen. I think they renamed it to Ghost Spider now, and I have not read any of that. But then. You had the uh, Into the Spider-Verse movie come out, and that book blew up, started going for three, four hundred bucks. But hey, I'm saving it. It's sentimental. Uh, the comics that I did keep were my Star Wars comics. I had a first appearance of a character named Dr. Da- Dr. Afra, kind of a female um, Indiana Jones mixed with Han Solo. So she's a scoundrel, but she's an archaeologist too. It's like a female version of a mashup of two of Harrison Ford's most iconic roles and she is one of the most popular new characters outside of the Mandalorian and Grogu to come out of the Disney uh, Star Wars canon. I had her first appearance. I knew that was valuable but I was going to keep all my Star Wars comics so I never really looked at how valuable it was until recently. And a buddy of mine starts named Paul, childhood friend, used to go to the comic book store with him uh, every week when we were growing up. A buddy of mine, Paul, starts getting into CGC books. He starts buying graded books. And I've never really got into CGC books. CGC stands for Certified Guarantee Company. You pay about $20 a book for a modern book. You send it to them, plus shipping. Uh, they grade it uh, anywhere between you know, a .5 to a 10.0, which is a gem mint, which is never obtained. Uh, it's usually shooting for a 9.8 is what most people want to get, which is a, a near mint copy. And the 9.8s fetch you a lot more in the aftermarket than a 9.6 or a 9.4 or a 9.2. Although those are considered very good solid grades on a comic book and can fetch you a lot of money in the aftermarket as well. And I had seen CGC books by whole life going to comic book conventions, but you know, it was books like uh, Amazing Spider-Man 123, 124, which was the death of Gwen Stacy. That may have been 121, uh, but anyway, the death of Gwen Stacy saga, and it's like, okay, I would love to have that book, but I'm not spending 800 to $1,800 depending on on the condition of a comic book. I never thought about sending a modern book to be graded. There weren't a whole bunch of modern books that were being graded and, sh- and, and sold back then at comic book shops or shows. But he's buying, like, Death Metal number 1 graded CGC 9.8. He's buying the jock variant cover of Batman li- Last Night on Earth, which was the recent Snyder and Capullo Batman's Elseworlds story graded 9.6 or 9.8 
and he's paying, you know, 40 or 50 bucks, but they're selling for that much on eBay. And you got to think, okay, it was a $3 book. It was 20 bucks to send it in to get it graded plus shipping. So let's say you're 30 bucks in. Um, it'll say it was a $5, not a $3 book. It's a $35 book at that point with graded shipping, the price of the book. But it's selling for 50, 60 bucks. I'm like, okay, this is some value, but nobody is getting rich off of this. But it just was amazing me that books that had just come out that had been graded at a 9.6 or 9.8 were starting to appreciate in value. And I'm like, what is going on here? And I start deep diving into this CGC uh, grading craze again with modern books with books that have come out in the past year past two years uh, books that had come out in the 2020 so far in the 2010s and, and then of course the the odds the 2000s some of these books are selling for like what I used to see silver age books sell for and I'm like what is going on here and What is really blowing up are first appearances when you have them graded. And there's some FOMO in this because people are buying up tons of single issues that they never plan on reading and hope that they get that one first appearance because they could spend $300 on comic books if $3 of that is that one first appearance that's worth $500-$600 they've turned a profit so there is FOMO in this uh, just like there is in the the Omni uh, collecting game okay all this is this is interesting these modern books are appreciating in value when graded it is crazy that uh, first appearance books that I had just sold that at the time I thought were worth 100 120 bucks are now worth three four hundred dollars so i was like okay let me check my spider gwen here let's see what this is i probably got about nine six copy and i started seeing that book that my wife paid a hundred bucks for going at a nine six for about a thousand and going at a nine eight for fifteen hundred dollars that's the difference in a nine eight nine six they're just rare to be in that condition this has to do with like your thumbprints on it the condition of the spine dings on the corner i'm not a cgc grader i'm not an expert at this i've never owned a cgc book i've never sent in a book to cgc i don't have a cgc account so this is just me going off a very basic knowledge as far as how they grade books there's all kinds of stuff on youtube about that uh, if you want to look into it but i'm like oh my gosh when this book was bought it was a hundred bucks and i thought that was a lot of money and then when as, uh, when you had the Into the Spider Verse came out, you had a, a uptick, right? It was a three, four hundred dollar book, but now it's a eleven hundred, fifteen hundred dollar book graded. And this is where I started to know that there is a a new boom in the comics industry, and it is a boom of CGC, true, but it isn't a boom of first appearances. And I'm starting to see now, as I look more and more into this, that DC is introducing more first appearance characters. I'm sure Marvel's doing it too. I've just been more focused on DC. Like they introduced not a yellow lantern, a gold lantern. They introduced a character called Ghostmaker in Batman, or I think it's Ghostmaker. Maybe it's Ghost King. I'm not caught up on Tinian's Batman. I got the Joker War hardcover coming, so looking forward to getting caught up. But he's a new villain they're introducing this new female character in batman 108 called miracle molly and people are buying up these copies like crazy thinking okay will this first appearance be valuable and then can i send it off to get a 9698 and make it really valuable well what really i think was the breaking point as far as this push over the edge of we might be in a comics boom with CGC, we might be in a comics boom with modern comics, especially first appearances, 
What confirmed that was this character known as Punchline, created by James Tinian. And this is where you get into some de- debate about first appearance. Uh, but before I talk about that, let's just talk about Punchline. So forever, Harley Quinn had been... I mean, mild spoilers for Tinian's Batman. Again, I'm not all the way caught up. For the longest time, Harley Quinn had been the um, most recent, most popular character, her and Deadpool. What I mean by that is most of the characters people love were created at, like in the 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, but, you know, you had Deadpool in the 90s or late 80s, and then you had Harley Quinn on the animated show, makes her comic book debut in Mad Love, and she becomes a fan favorite character. Well, since Harley, you know, you've had your Spider Gwens, you've had your Miles over at Marvel, but you've never had a character reach the popularity of like Harley status, action figures, tattoos, statues, cosplay. I mean, just, and not just, hey, it's a flash in the pan, like it's lasted years and years and years. Paul Denny. Uh, from Batman, the animated series, I believe. Maybe Bruce Tim co-created, but I think Paul Denny created Harley Quinn. Well, James Tinian introduces this character, new female character called Punchline, and it appears that she is Joker's new girlfriend. She's not. She's more of a business partner. Uh, but she takes on Harley Quinn, uh, nearly kills her, and just some awesome hand-to-hand combat panels in the pages of James Tinney and Batman. And she is so bad that she forces Harley to be good. And this character instantaneously becomes a fan favorite. Unlike anything I've ever seen at Marvel or DC. I mean, since I've been reading an over since 06, as I always say, but I heard Harley was like this, and it's, it's obvious you can see it. Deadpool was like this. It's obvious you can see how popular these characters are, but still, those characters were created and brought into comics at a time that I wasn't paying attention to comics. I was watching the animated series when Harley was on, but I had no idea she was also in the comics until much later on. Seeing this in real time, is a different, different beast. This character has blown up unlike anything I've ever seen. Her appearances, which have occurred in the past couple months, have gone from $5 books to, at 9.8s, going for $500 books. Remember, it took the Spider-Gwen appearing in a movie to get to that point. It took Miles appearing in a movie to get to that point. This character has not been in any movie. No actress has played her. She hasn't been on any TV show. She's not in the DCEU. She's she's not even on the animated series like Harley Quinn was. She is clearly and purely a popular comic book character. And this is where you kind of get into this first appearance debate because people are like, I got the first appearance of Punchline. They're like, no, 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 I got the first appearance of Punchline. So when it comes to first appearances, there's two different types. There's a cameo, meaning the character appears in the book, but usually is in the background, doesn't have any speaking, any dialogue, any speaking dialogue any word bubbles on the page, but they appear. For her, this took place in a year of the villain spinoff called Hell Arisen Number 3. It's a cool cover. Joker's on the front. There's flames in the background. So that's her first cameo. And some people say that's her first appearance, and that's a very expensive book. And then others claim Batman 89. No, that is her first appearance because... Uh, We're introduced to who she is. She has dialogue. She is featured prominently in that story. So that's what we call not a cameo appearance, a full appearance. Both of these are valuable. It's almost an equal value. I think Wolverine, for example, Wolverine had a cameo appearance in 180. But 181 is when he was first in there beating, and I say 180, 181. 
I mean, Incredible Hulk. That's where Wolverine debuted. If you didn't know, most of you probably know if you're listening to this podcast. Wolverine cameos, I believe, in Incredible Hulk 180 at the end. Then he's full tilt in that story in Incredible Hulk 181. Both those are valuable books. 181 happens to be valuable, more valuable. But Wolverine's also on the cover of that one. He's not on the cover of Incredible Hulk 180. Now, you have your cameo, you have your first full appearance, then you have your first cover appearance. So, if we're talking about punchlines, who we're talking about, she's changed the comics industry, or she's been the the evidence that the industry's changed, and I think it's really booming, unlike anything I've ever seen. And I think it's more than just her being a great character, a, a badass character. Then you have first cover appearance. That is Batman number 92, Awesome cover, so that's valuable. Not as valuable as the full or the cameo, but still holding value. You can look these on eBay. I'm not going to look at every price here, but we're talking the the instantaneous when they came out went from being five six dollar books to hundred dollar books, which is I've never bought a comic off a shelf in the modern age for four bucks, and then a week later it's worth a hundred bucks like that. That just doesn't happen, but it it is now, especially with Punchline. So you got Batman number 92. That is going to be her first cover appearance. Then you have her origin told, which is something that took a while to get for Harley, I believe. But we get this early on in the Joker 80th anniversary special. You get an 11, 12-page story with her origin. And then there's another book that the value is looking like it's starting to go up. It's a punchline one-shot that dives deeper into her uh, origin. Why am I bringing up punchline? Because to me, she is the perfect example of the different values of first appearances. You got your cameo, you got your full appearance, you got your cover appearance, you got your origin appearance. If you're hunting down these books for value, that is the type of thing that you're looking at now. I think Punchline's the perfect storm here. She comes about during this first appearance CGC trajectory, and she's such a popular upward trajectory, and she's such a popular, well-written, aesthetically pleasing character who turns Harley Quinn's dynamic with the Joker upside down that that combined with all this other hype has made the comics industry just blow up. And we get into now what's called speculation. And just like there's entire YouTube channels that cover Omnis and Collected Editions, there's entire ones that focus on speculation. And what I mean by that is, hey, this book may be valuable. Go and hunt it down before it's too late. It's a $20 book now. Uh, in a year, it could be a $200 book. It could be a $500 book. Some good ones I recommend is Como Comics. It's a comic book store owner uh, in Missouri. Como, C-O-M-O. Look him up on YouTube. And then No Coast Comics. He does a lot of great speculation. Speculating with comics is like speculating on Wall Street. I could buy a $100 book, and it could go up to be in a $500 book when they make a show based on that said book, but I'm taking a risk. Uh, For example, you can buy Jeff Lemire's Descender for not cheap, but 30, 40 bucks, and if they make that into a show, it's a $400 book. So speculators have been talking about this on YouTube and on forums, and people have went out, and they bought four copies of of this book, and at that point, you're in over 220 bucks with a book like Descender. If that show is made and that show becomes a Walking Dead like hit, that 40 turns into 400 a piece. There you go. If not, you're out 220 bucks. So you got to keep in mind that speculation is a dangerous game. Uh, when you're collecting these comics, we talked about CGC. Also, when I'm throwing around the values of these comics here, oh, this is worth 100 this is worth 500 it's at its peak value when it's graded. So there's two types of comics. There is raw, meaning it's 
you can read it, you can open it, you can flip through it, just like you buy it at the comic book shop. And then there's graded. You pay the money to send it in the CGC. They give you back a grade, hopefully a 9.6 or a 9.8. And all of a sudden, I pay 5 bucks for a book. I pay 20 bucks to get it graded, 10 in shipping. I'm 35 in. That book usually goes from a $35 book to a $75 to $100 book if there's any interest or if there's any speculation about it. So you can get memberships to CGC, $30 membership gets you in. The best membership's $150 for a year. You pay $150 and they give you $150 credit. And so that lets you send in about seven books and you can pay extra to get it shipped back. If you're sending in books before 1975, it costs a little more. They take up to 25 bucks books at a time, 25 bu- not bucks, books at a time. And if uh, you're going to grade books, it's best to wait till you have 25 books to grade, send them in. It saves you on shipping uh, and uh, they have reasonable ways to get the books there and get the books back when it comes to shipping. You want to know about that, go on YouTube and I want you guys to seek out No Coast Comics. He's He seems like a genuinely good guy. So I'm not going to grade books. I don't think I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, at the end. I don't want to pay for this membership, but just how I'm seeing the market change and come back fascinating that's why I'm talking nearly an hour up until this point about this and I have I have more to say guys this is just this is my passion here not the selling but just these characters and people realizing not just the monetary value of these characters right? but the story always matters more than the dough remember that 90s comics, which I mentioned earlier, are going up in value. Things like Spawn, which they printed a gazillion copies of. Things like some of the early X-Men issues, which were, uh, you know, in dollar bins for decades, are now, when graded, $100 books. Why is this the case? Well, there's a couple reasons. We're in a 30-year nostalgia cycle. Uh, We're 30 years removed from 1991 and 2021, and that's how nostalgia works. It goes through that cycle. You have some hot 90s characters returning or making some big splashes as far as events. We talked about the year of Spawn and Spawn's universe a couple weeks ago. You also have the return of the Milestone imprint, which was the black imprint with characters like Static Shock, Hardware returning. Grifter from Wildcats is now showing up in Batman. Of course, Jim Lee, when he left Image, he brought his studio that was within Image Wildstorm into DC. So now you're starting to see a lot of these characters pop up. So some of those books are appreciating in value. But what really ended up happening here is people thought they were going to cash in these 90s books. They bought a ton of them. They printed a ton of them. The comics industry blew up. But after that, the bottom fell out because people realized, I'm not going to buy these books. They're not going to hold their value like gold, silver age books. And comic book stores put them in the dollar bin. They sold them here and there. But a lot of people just threw these books away. And now there's not this. There's still a lot of them. There's still more of them than there are silver age books. And now you're starting to see the value of these go up because people toss these books. You're also starting, I'm talking about the 90s books right now, you're also starting to see 90s style art. I mentioned metal, death metal. Greg Capullo, one of the biggest artists of the 90s, is now bringing in some of that 90s style through his death metal story for Scott Steiner's Batman which is now wrapped up but was a bestseller for them and I think that he had a more modern art style when he was doing the new 52 Batman and now what you're seeing is that he's bringing in or bringing back that style he had in the 90s with Spawn that 90 year nostalgia cycle is just so so real Guys, I mean, it, it is, and but now that these '90s books are showing uh, are starting to blow up, a lot of the 
what's called the Copper Age, which some people don't recognize. Some people only recognize the Gold, Silver, Bronze Age, but comic collectors have started deeming 1984 to 91, which gets you from the original Marvel Secret Wars up until the Image Revolution as being the Copper Age. That's where you get, like, Amazing Spider-Man number 300 and where you get... Uh, some of the Peter David Hulk books and stuff that have recently blew up and kind of became unobtainable for a lot of uh, moderate collectors who don't want to spend four or five hundred on a book. They want to spend one or two hundred on a book if they're collecting. Uh, so the Copper Age has kind of priced people out. And now we're getting into the more modern age books starting to really become collectible since the Copper Age has priced a lot of lower tier collectors uh, out. And and that's been uh, interesting. I, I also think the TV projects have driven up the, spot, uh, the spec market. You saw this with WandaVision with, I mentioned the House of M trade paperback, the House of M variants, the, the House of M miniseries tie-ins, it's just crazy that something like the first appearance of the Dark Hole, which was a $20 book, and Marvel Spotlight number, I believe it was number four, after that appears on the show, it's a $500 book. That's what it sold for on eBay. Just insane to me. Not a character, a book. And the speculation that that book would be in the TV show drove the price of it up, not just the appearance. So if you cashed in at the right time, you could have sold that Marvel Spotlight number four, even if for a couple hundred bucks, which had been a $20 book, even if the Dark Hole book, which it ended up appearing in WandaVision, even if it did not appear in WandaVision. So the spec on these TV shows, especially now these weekly Disney Plus shows, We'll see if that continues with, you know, Falcon and Winter Soldier, Loki and whatnot. I imagine the first appearance of Winter Soldier and Brew Baker's Captain America. No, I think it was Captain America, his third issue of Captain America. I don't know the number, but I'm sure uh, the value of that's going to go up. We mentioned the Val Zod, the black Superman, who is probably going to be featured in Tananasi Coates and J.J. Abrams Superman movie. He first appeared in Final Crisis number seven. And <laughs> that was before the announcement that they were going to make this movie. That was a $4 book. After they announced that they, not that they are, that they may be making a Superman movie featuring an African American Superman who is Val Zod. Who knows, it could be a black Clark Kent, which is fine, but at that point, it's not Val Zod. So, Final Crisis number 7, written by Grant Morrison, which features the first appearance of the African-American Superman, Val Zod, before that announcement, could be had in a dollar bin, could be had on eBay for 8 bucks. Now, graded as selling for six eighty, raw is selling for 3 uh, or 400 bucks. So you see how the speculation of not just the market, but these shows and movies are driving the market. Two different types of speculation. Speculation that they might show this, which might make this value of a certain book go up. So we have our speculation of Valzad, which creates speculation in the comic book market. All of a sudden, Final Crisis number seven selling for six eighty. His first cover appearance is selling uh, for close to that, and it's it's just very fascinating to see the TV impact the comic books market. Not in driving people to the store necessarily to read the stories, but to hope that they hit on these first appearances. If that gets them in and reading and they start to legitimately read the stories and enjoy the characters like, oh yeah, Scarlet Witch is awesome on WandaVision, but man, she's even better in these books like House of M. 
that's that's great but if they're just going in and buying up all these books uh, because they hope they hit a first appearance and they hit one or two and they're not reading these other books they're just disposing of them and to meet the demand Marvel and DC are printing more and to meet the hype we're getting first we're just throwing out characters to make people go to the store and buy their first appearance and we have a run in the 2020s and the 20s here of a bunch of first appearances and people are like wait there's a first appearance this month that month there's so many of these these things are not valuable i'm going to quit going to the store and buying these things you risk a a bubble again and that scares me especially following covid as a comic books reader but this is this this boom in the meantime has helped brick and mortar stores survive covid uh and minus some we're just now getting to where we're getting these events like the new heroes reborn and stuff and and dc infinite frontier so that's going to help as well here is Another thing, this is what I'm going to end on, and I'm wondering if this is going to, all this is going to usher in a new age of comics. So, I, I, I recognize the Copper Age, some don't, some just go gold, silver, and bronze, and then modern. I go gold, silver, bronze, copper, and then I say anything after the image revolution is going to be modern when Jim Lee, Todd McFarlane, Mark Silvestri, Rob Liefeld, all those guys founded Image Comics and let creators take control over their characters and their stories. Creator owned stuff, which has been just so great for the industry over the past 30 years. I think we're now potentially entering a new age of comics. And I don't know if that means that we will rename the previous years from the modern age to maybe like the image age. Or, I mean, that would work for me. Who knows what these things will end up being. We're speculating about the name of these comics eras now. So speculation is always fun but dangerous because it could be wrong and get people's hopes up. And get people to spend money in the case of comics that maybe they don't have. But I think the age that we're getting ready to go into or have went into, especially with Punchline, is the villain's age or the age of the villain. Now, it's going to be called the modern age, but I think when we look back, this marks the beginning of this new modern age, um, let's say from Punchline on. And that is right now, these villains are just as popular as these heroes, but especially at DC. And the Joker's always been my favorite villain. Love the Hamill Joker on the animated series, the Nicholson Joker. I mean, Heath Ledger's Joker is my all time favorite performance in any movie. I defended Jared Leto's Joker. And w- with all these different Jokers in movies and TV shows, you think we would have Joker fatigue? We just had Joaquin Phoenix, great performance, dark movie, won an Oscar which was just very cool to see, and he was able to accept it, unlike, sadly, Heath Ledger couldn't for his Joker portrayal in 08's The Dark Knight. But the Joker is as popular now. I think he's more popular now than he's ever been. Just talking to some people that work at comic book shops, hearing comic book podcasts and stuff talk for... Since 1986, since Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns, Batman has been far and away the most popular character in DC. They have to have two or three Batman books out. Uh, Batman's consistently sold over 100,000 copies of his titles, while other titles, even strong ones, have been 70, 80K, lower ones 30 or 40K. Again, books aren't selling millions like they were in the 90s. Batman's been the face, the most popular character, DC. Not always, at one point Superman was, but consistently he has been the flagship in movies, on the screen, and at the comic book store. And that has been the case every year since 1986 because, again, I'm going to reinstate it, the seminal work, Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns. But now... 
as a result of Joker War, which is supposed to be an incredible story, and his new partnership with Punchline and James Tinian giving him his own solo series. If Batman's the most popular character at DC, Joker is now the most second most popular character, and arguably some people will say the most, just as popular at least as Batman. To me, that's insane. That Joker is more popular than Superman. That Joker is more popular than Wonder Woman. That Joker is more popular than The Flash. I can't tell you why. I don't think it's a result of the movies. It seems like people in movie industry and on film Twitter have Joker fatigue. But comic book fans do not. The Joker 80th anniversary special which featured Punchline's origin sold insane amounts joker number one by james tinian and sold insane amounts tons of variant covers i think with punchline the new modern age we could be entering the age of the villain in comic books so we will see what the industry looks like a year two years from now it'll be fascinating to revisit this conversation during the middle of this decade and and looking back hopefully this was a a good turning point for the industry and not a bubble not just a short period boom but hey unless you have disposable income i'm gonna wrap up here just talking about collecting and this i'm gonna make this brief because i I know i've went on a lot about collecting and comics today but again it's my passion it's my bread and butter of my geekdom probably even more so than star wars is the comic book superheroes in comic books dc and marvel but the bottom line is unless you have a ton of disposable in disposable income you kind of got to pick one thing to focus collecting on i don't mean you can't collect more than one thing but you're going to spend the vast majority amount of your money on one thing and on one format for me That's going to be omnibuses, deluxe editions, trade paperbacks, mainly omnibuses now because I like how they display on the shelf. I like having a complete run of a character by a creative team. I like having a complete run of a story such as Secret Invasion. Just to throw one out there, that's an omnibus I'm on that I haven't picked up. But my friends who I've talked to who collect, you know, they all agree None of us are rich. I don't think any of us are poor either, but none of us, most of us have kids. And we all have kids now. The people I'm on the list, just talking to my friends now, Joe and Paul, who I grew up with going to the uh, comic book store. Joe's focusing on magic cars. Paul's focusing on mainly, he mixes things up, but he has a focus on Batman, not several different characters. So that allows him to buy CGC Batman, a Batman hardcover, a Batman trade, Batman action figure. For Jerry, you always know it's the toys. My buddy Will, it appears, who I mentioned earlier, is getting in the CGC. I think it's cool that these people are focusing on what they're collecting as far as characters and stuff, but more importantly, the format they're collecting. But for me right now, it's the omnibuses that are driving my collecting habits. Uh, What are you guys collecting now? Let me know in the comments below. If you are collecting comics... Are you getting into the Omnis? Will you pick up an Omni after listening to this podcast? Would you ever buy a CGC book? Would you ever sign up for a CGC account and send books to be graded? Are you out there hunting in the wild raw copies of first appearance characters? Do you go dollar bin diving hoping to find that, that well out in the wild? Let me know. Comment on YouTube. Uh, email me. Good old fashioned email. You can email me at thepicreview at gmail.com. thepicreview at gmail.com. Check out my stuff on Twitter. You can find me on Twitter at the real Brad Bell. The R E E L Brad Bell. As always, you find this podcast at its original home, The Epic Review thepicreview.com check out my comic reviews if you're on tumblr just search the real brad on tumblr the r-e-e-l brad and uh, check me out on there 
Tumblr's been so much fun. I know I keep saying that, but I, I can't stress enough how fun it's been being on Tumblr, and especially the comics Tumblr. But make sure, if you're not subscribed to the YouTube channel, make sure you su sub. Give this video a thumbs up if you like this show. It, it helps more people find the show. If you if you like the show, also comment letting us know what you liked about the show. That helps. Any and everything helps, guys. I look to grow the podcast, grow the YouTube channel, uh, which is hard being audio only, but I know we can do it. Uh, this has definitely been a 9.8 podcast, I would say, as far as our discussion. Okay, maybe, maybe it's a 9.6, at least a 9.4 uh, on the CGC scale as far as our discussion on the comics industry, first appearances, Omnis, Graydon. It's been a lot of fun. It's been something I wanted to talk about with you guys for a long, long time. Uh, thank you so much for click and play. I hope you guys have a great week. I hope you're staying safe out there. Uh, it looks like we're getting back to some semblance of normal, and that is awesome. Maybe we can have comic conventions soon. Maybe we can go to superhero movies uh, together soon maybe we can congregate in comic book stores soon on saturdays and uh, just enjoy being with our friends and family uh, most importantly and sharing these things we love with them because ultimately that is what it is all about but once again for the 112th edition of the confirmed epic podcast from the hollywood foothills of north carolina we are out that's all i have to say about that